Welcome. How are you tonight? It's nice to have people here in the space at the Lyceum, but also watching us online. Uh, my name is Rod Cookrow. I am the chairman of Gen Alexandria this year, and I want to welcome you here for a very important program. Before we start, I'll ask you to, to please uh, put, put on mute your, your phones. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our moderator, and she will handle the panel. Uh, and then there will be questions available to be asked through the audience. Some will be going around with, 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 uh, with index cards where you can write down, legibly, a question for the panel. Uh, and that's also people online can submit questions as well. Um, how many of you here have been to a Gen Alexandria forums before? Anybody? Oh, good. Is anybody new? Cool. Welcome. I hope you'll come back again. Because next month and in April, we're doing back-to-back -back programs on the arena. Um, and I'm guessing that will be an interesting, interesting program. Um, I, want to in, I want to introduce in our audience tonight, we have, we have a one, one VIP from our city council, Aaliyah Gaskins is here. <laughs> Aaliyah, uh, Aaliyah served on the board of this group actually three years ago, was it? Three years ago. Thank you for coming. I appreciate your interest in this. Um, every February in recent years, we have done a program dedicated to something having to do with Black History Month, because in Alexandria, it's an important topic. And to this day, it resonates with people. The city has, of course, a relatively dark past with regard to race, going back to the 19th century, uh, as most places in Virginia did, all some places in Maryland. But we had it here as well. And, and it was only until the 1970s where things started, the dam started to break, so to speak, where things, there was progress being made. But nevertheless, there's still a phenomenon going on Demographically, where in recent decades we have lost uh, a significant portion of our, uh, I would say, legacy African American population because of the high cost of housing in the city and gentrification. The city's tried to address that through several things, including housing assistance programs. Uh, the city passed just uh, two years ago a pilot program on, on, on uh, income assistance. Let's see if that was going to work for folks. And even the zoning for housing initiative that was passed by the council earlier this year was actually described by Mayor Justin Wilson as the city's sort of effort at reparations. So the city's been trying to address the, the legacy of, of race in the city. Um, there's been progress made, but I think we're going to hear from our speakers tonight that there's more to be done, but I'm sure they'll talk about the progress as well. Uh, so I want to introduce uh, Darylin Franklin, who's on our board. Darylin is, is chairman of the local chapter of the NAACP, and uh, she's done a great job of assembling this panel, and I know she's going to do a great job moderating our conversation. We're going to go for about an hour and 15 minutes, unless there are lots of questions. We'll go for an hour and a half, but then we'll cut it off. And certainly at the end of the program, you're welcome to stay and talk to our panelists. In the meantime, if you want to get up quietly, we do have refreshments here at the back of the room and they're part of your cost of admission, so please take advantage of that. If you're watching online, you're out of luck. Uh, anyway, thank you for coming, and uh, Daryl Lynn, come on up and uh, take over. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. So the idea for Black History Month was first conceived by historian Carter G. Woodson and members of his association for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Together they organized Negro History Week beginning in February 1926. They selected the month of February for it is celebrated because of it, the close birthdays of President Abraham Lincoln who had been responsible for the Emancipation Proclamation and for Frederick Douglass um, who was the creator and abolitionist um, here in the United States. During the next 50 years, Negro History Week grew in popularity with American cities initiating their own celebrations and of uh, black achievements. With teachers, particularly in <clears throat> schools with large percentages of African American students. 
using class time to discuss the contributions of history made by notable African Americans, the Civil Rights Movement also contributed to its popularity. Negro, um, Negro History Week grew to become Black History Month in 1976 under um, then President Gerald Ford, who urged Americans to participate in its observation. And for me, personally, it's about the rich richness of a culture, the uh, perseverance and overcoming. And if you're talking about slavery and oppression of 400 years of Jim Crow, the desegregation of schools wasn't that long ago. We're talking about pain, but we're also talking about the triumphs and o of overcoming. There's a lot for us to be proud of, and I'm very proud to be an African-American woman standing here before you this evening. But if people don't recognize the pain of many African-Americans living today and have gone before us, they will never understand the struggle of what it is to be black in America. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We have Ms. Audrey Davis, who is the create, excuse me, the Director of African American History Division at the, of the Office of Historic Alexandria. We have Ms. Octavia Stanton Caldwell, who is Associate Pastor of Outreach at Shiloh Baptist Church. And last but not least, we have Ms. Christian Moon. She is Professor at the Department at the Department of History and American Studies at um, University of Mary Washington. Our panelists, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm gonna begin with each panelist, and if you would like to tell us a little bit about yourself, and I want to personally thank each and every one of you for agreeing to come in and sit with us tonight just to discuss this very important topic. So I will start with Ms. Caldwell. Reverend Caldwell. <laughs> good evening, it's good to be here everyone. Um, just a little about myself, I happen to be a fifth generation Alexandrian. I grew up in Alexandria. <laughs> I grew up in this city um, and I actually attended uh, Parker Gray High School and then when they closed Parker Gray, I went to George Washington and that's where I graduated in 1968. You do the math. <laughs> um, and I also went to George Mason University, was part of the first class that uh, integrated. I, as you know, um, Alexandria um, was one of the last states to actually integrate. And, and so uh, we were in 1974 at George Mason, out of 6,000 students, there were 100 African Americans, and that was full-time, part-time, uh, graduate and undergraduate combined. So there are a lot of firsts that um, I'm a part of in the city. So it's good to be here, and I look forward to a riveting discussion with my fellow panelists. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Davis. Hello, uh, Terry. I know many of you. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm Audrey Davis. I'm the director of the Division of African American History for the Office of Historic Alexandria. And I'm happy to say that because it is a new position for the Office of Historic Alexandria, only implemented uh, in last fe February with the reorg of the Office of Historic Alexandria. So I am building a staff now, so looking forward to see how, seeing how that will come together. I have been with the city of Alexandria. Last year was my 30th year. I, uh, I am uh, a DC native, one of the few, one of the proud <laughs> <laughs> DC natives, and uh, I can say that. And I uh, went to school at the University of Virginia uh, for my college, uh, my undergraduate and my graduate degrees, which were in art history. And I'm very, very uh, proud to be a uh, member of the City of Alexandria staff and government, and I think that we're doing amazing work here, and that I've definitely been, been able to see in 30 years a great deal of change, and I think that we are moving in an upward uh, trajectory, so I'm, I'm really happy about that. And Professor Moon. Hi, everybody. My name's uh, Kristen Moon, and 
Uh, I am not a native Washingtonian or a five-generation Alexandrian. Uh, I'm originally from New Hampshire, a small town who, at the age of 18, uh, ended up in Los Angeles, not for Hollywood, but actually to go to college. And from there, I ended on the East Coast and uh, got my master's and PhD in Baltimore. And then sort of as things sort of rolled, I uh, ended up here in Alexandria. I was taking a an adult education class with Pam Cressy, and she said to me, hey, Kristen, I have something that I think you could help us with. And the next thing I knew, I was Alice in Wonderland going down a, a big rabbit hole, and that rabbit hole was Fort Ward. Um, over a decade ago, I went on, started my journey doing public history here in Alexandria. As a field, as a discipline, it really didn't exist. There, in terms of academia, we hadn't really developed this idea of bridging that gap between the ivory tower and the communities that we actually serve. Um, it has been a wonderful experience. Uh, I volunteer all the time <laughs> in a variety of ways, uh, usually doing historical research, serving this community, and I look forward to keep on doing that in the future. Thank you. So we're gonna start with a question that I'm gonna ask Ms. Caldwell and Professor Moon. If you could each answer the following question in your own words, I'm going to start with Ms. Octavia first. Um, please describe uh, the challenges African Americans face in the city of Alexandria during post-Civil War and J uh, Jim Crow era. Now, of course, I was not here. <laughs> <laughs> But from what I've been able to, to glean, um, there really isn't much difference between the challenges that were faced then and the challenges that are being faced now. One of the largest challenges was in the housing area um, because, um, first of all, making enough money to be able to afford a house then was difficult because most of the jobs that men had were menial and most of the jobs that women had were domestics working in other people's homes. So it was real challenging to, to make enough money to actually buy a house. Um, and then there were restrictions on where you could live as an African American in the city of Alexandria. Um, and so housing was, it, it was a challenge. And because you needed a realtor to help you with the house, often blacks were cheated because they would sell their house, they would sell a house and for a little amount of money and then they would resell it for amount of money and they would, the realtors would make the, the bulk of the money. But um, there were small areas, the, the population was kind of scattered around the city, but I understand that there were small areas where um, blacks lived in, in certain communities like on the hill, um, Old Town, there was a colored Rosemont, and, um, but it was still the challenge. And, and so even now, I understand it's difficult for many African Americans to buy homes in the city of Alexandria because the cost is so great. Not only blacks, I mean, a lot of people can't afford to buy the homes. I know when my husband and I looked for our first home, he was from DC and I was from Alexandria and we did look in Alexandria for housing and um, for the amount of money we had set aside, we could get uh, a duplex, but not a standalone. For that same amount of money in Prince George's County, we ended up getting um, a ranch house on two acres of land. Mm. So housing is still probably one of the larger ones. There were small businesses that existed to support the community because there were still restrictions on where people could go and buy. Um, and actually, if you think about it, um, pre or post Civil War and, um, and the Jim Crow area, still, that era still exists to some, I mean, historically they say it ended around 1965, 1968, but there's still some remnants of it in the city even today. And so, um, 
have we come far? We have. There has been some progress. Um, there are forces that would probably want us to go back to the Jim Crow era, um, and we just need to make sure that that does not happen. Agreed. Professor Moon? All right. Well, I don't have enough time to lay this sure. all out. I, I <laughs> but I do want to, since uh, Reverend Caldwell sort of started, what I'm going to do is try to fill in gaps where I can on this, because this is actually a huge topic. And in Alexandria, it's also a really unique topic. We are special. I hope you all know that. <laughs> we are. And there are forces that make us extraordinary that sometimes we forget uh, that we take for granted. After the Civil War, African Americans had fought to be treated as human. And things that we take for granted, marriage, the sanctity of their families, right? The ab ability to sign a contract, the ability to own land, political rights, to, to vote, right? To hold political office. We saw people in this community demand that they have access to that. And, and sometimes they were very successful. We saw our first African Americans on city council in 1870. It's an extraordinary story, and we should celebrate and recognize that. We also see African Americans serving and in public education. African American women in 1861, the moment Union troops rolled in, they said, public schools, now, right? They made it happen. Amazing. But they also faced enormous hurdles and adversity. And we have to recognize that as well. To make sure their children had equitable education, families here took their children to DC so they could go to high school, so they could go to college. Many of these families couldn't afford that. This is one of the things, by the way, that does make our community extraordinary, the strategies, the pure grit that people had so that their children could have a better life, maybe a better life than themselves. People also came here, they migrated here from other parts of Virginia in the 19th century because of the federal government's proximity. The types of jobs, were they great? No, but they were stable. And by the 1920s, they also offered things like pension programs, which a lot of people would rely on. These types of things, I think, um, are at play in Alexandria that makes us somewhat unique, but that does not negate the adversity, the violence, the uh, segregationist legislation that also happened here as well. So we have to see all of our complexity, the good and the bad, in our past, in our present, and in our future. Wow. Thank you for that, both of you for that. Okay, the next question is from Ms. Davis. Discuss the importance of the Alex City of Alexandria Community Remembrance Project. Oh, I'm happy to. I don't know if, I, I think I, I am very happy to share information about that project, which uh, was supported by City Council and began in 2019. Uh, do many of you in the audience know about the Alexandria Community Remembrance Project? Great, great. So for those of you who don't, those of you who don't, the Alexandria Community Remembrance Project is really our social justice initiative. And it's our work that we're doing here in Alexandria that is actually being spearheaded by the work of attorney Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. And they set a challenge to communities across the United States to tackle their very difficult and troubling history of racial terror hate crimes. And in Alexandria, we have two documented lynchings, of one of Joseph McCoy on April 23rd, 1897, the second of Benjamin Thomas on August 8th, 1899. Those are the only two documented lynchings, and we are not saying that there might not have been others. There are actually some other cases in Alexandria history where they, it could be considered a racial terror or hate crime, but right now we are focusing on McCoy and Benjamin Thomas, and I'm actually very proud to say that through the work of the Alexandria Community Remembrance Project, we are offering the first two scholarships uh, in their honor uh, this year through the Alexandria scholarship, um, through the Scholarship Fund of Alexandria, and we will be giving those out in May. But what the work that you do is through EJI and through ACRP is having honest discussions educating our community because we say with the ACRP we want Alexandria to be a welcoming community bound by equity and inclusion and so our work is geared towards that we educate about Alexandria black history we have instituted annual remembrances in honor of McCoy and Thomas that have been going on since we were established by City Council 
we have markers at the site. Uh, last August, we included a new marker at the city jail, courtesy of Walt Steimel, a, a citizen who's been very active with the ACRP. So you can learn more about that history as you travel around Alexandria. And so for us, it's very important to tell these stories, to not hide them. And it's also very important to make contact with the families who are impacted by this. And we've had our genealogist extraordinaire, Shara Makargo Ba, who's actually at the Black History Museum on Sunday for a program, researching the lineage of both McCoy and Thomas, and she's been able to make contact with both families. We have very active participation with the McCoy family who have been working with us since they found out. And imagine not knowing your history. The family actually had lived here in Alexandria, and then after the lynching moved to Pittsburgh but some of the younger generation now had no idea why that happened. Mm -hmm. And with Shar's report and her research to them, they now understand why that happened. The Thomas family who were with us in August, they were very impressed by the work of ACRP and very thankful for the work because again, they too didn't know the history. And now they have this report. And we let the descendants or the relatives of these two young men guide us in what we do because overall what ACRP wants to do is give voice to the African Americans who were voiceless in the past. So they guide us in their actions and form us. The Thomas family has decided that they don't want as much of a public facing role, but they support what we're doing. And I'm also proud to say later this year, you will see a documentary about the lives of Joseph McCoy, Benjamin Thomas, the ACRP, uh, with uh, a speaking role from some members of the McCoy family. Thank you very much. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. Okay, I'm gonna change the next question around just a little bit because I remembered something really important. Um, anyone could take this question. Discuss the importance of Freedom House and what is there. Audrey. I will take that question as my office is in Freedom House. and. Uh, <laughs> So what do you do during a pandemic uh, when you are shut down? You, you buy a building. And uh, the city of Alexandria purchased Freedom House in March of 2020. Uh, we are very grateful to then city manager Mark Jinks uh, for helping to, and council, city council for helping to make that possible. And we had a relationship or still have a relationship with the Northern Virginia Urban League. And I have to give all credit to them because they purchased the building in the 1990s and one of the things that they did in 2008 as a gift to the city was create an exhibit on the lower level uh, talking about the domestic slave trade which most people don't really think about they think about the transatlantic slave trade but they don't think about the internal domestic slave trade and we are really ground zero uh, for that us and, and richmond and so they created this wonderful exhibit uh, that was in the basement and in 2018, the 10th anniversary, we came in to help manage uh, the museum. So we increased, uh, we set sort of standard visitation hours. Uh, we added a, a little bookstore that was there so people could learn more about the history. We gave guided tours. We had a PowerPoint uh, that we had upstairs because some people couldn't get down uh, to the basement. And then when it came time and the Urban League decided that they wanted to sell the building, we took over in 2020. And during the pandemic, our work was creating the museum that you see today, which is only one part of the story, which is the first phase of the story. So if you visit 1315 Duke Street, we have centered this exhibit or all the exhibits on the three floors to give you, to give voice to the African Americans. We know that five different dealers or human traffickers operated out of that site between 1828 and the Union occupation in 1861. But the thing that we want to focus on are the thousands of African American men, women, and children trafficked through Alexandria to the Deep South for many, many years of bondage. And so in our museum, we try to rid ourselves of leg legacy language. We don't use master, mistress. We always refer to those who were uh, there in the building as enslaved. So we really also try to, because in this world of people accusing one another of fake history, when we have a text panel in the museum, we not only give you the text and the history, but we give you another panel saying, how do we know? 
And so we tell you all of our sources so that you can check them out yourself. Right now, what you're seeing in the building is temporary. We have an exhibit to the domestic slave trade in the Civil War on the first floor. On the second floor, we have a traveling exhibit called Determined from the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond. But we've supplemented that, uh, and we have an exhibit within an exhibit called Determined in Alexandria. And that not only talks about slavery, but also black achievement, because African Americans are not just defined by slavery. And then on the third floor, we have a painting exhibition by the late artist Sherry Sanabria. Half of that painting exhibition is on the top floor of Freedom House. The other half is in the Black History Museum. And she focuses on uh, slave quarters, or what are what were called slave quarters, that are now vanishing from our landscape. And she calls it her exhibit before the spirits are swept away, because she's, when she was alive, she said she liked to get into these places while the spirit of the people were still there. We are now in our master plan uh, phase. Uh, some of you in the audience are part of that master plan phase, and we are proud to say we have descendants of even uh, some of the dealers that uh, operated out of that site working with us as their way of making amends. And so we will be presenting publicly in April about the master plan, and you'll hear about future plans for the museum. And since we've reopened uh, uh, on Juneteenth uh, 2022, the museum is fully accessible. We have a working elevator for all three floors. So please get in touch with us. We would love to take you on a tour. Thank you so much for that. So I have a question for you, a follow-up question for that. So. The, the lower level, is that open? The lower level is not open now, and many people ask about that because that's the memory that they have of the building. And going down those stairs into that very claustrophobic space really sort of gave you a sense of the hopelessness and, and the fear of the people who were trafficked there. One of the reasons we have it closed right now is because our goal uh, with equity is to be fully accessible in every part of the building. So uh, right now, we have not made the basement open. We are also researching what that area was used for. There are some reports that it might have been an area uh, for torture to get uh, the enslaved who were not compliant to be more compliant if they were traveling by foot. Uh, we all, but we want to fully find out how that space was used. And then we also want to investigate through our master plan, how do we want to see this space used in the future? So, and then also, unfortunately, we have had in the past a lot of water issues in the building. Rainy days are not our friend at Freedom House. And uh, so we are working on those mitigation issues. And so you're going to see work going on in the building. You're going to see scaffolding that's going up around the building. So we are being great student stewards of the building uh, physically for the physical part of the building, but also being careful in the historical part as well. Thank you for that. So the next question is from Ms. Caldwell, Pastor Caldwell. Um, as a minister, Shiloh Baptist Church, what do you see as the biggest challenges of African Americans at the moment? Uh, there are a number of current challenges for African Americans in Alexandria and in the country as a whole. Um, of course, because there is a, an election looming, uh, that's probably one of the first concerns because there are, at last count, about 14 states that have instituted um, voter suppression or attempts to uh, suppress voter suppression. And um, there are individuals and groups that are doing things like making fake robocalls and convincing people not to, to go out and vote. So I think um, voting rights is still uh, a very big challenge for African Americans um, today. Um, additionally, um, equity in healthcare. I think one of the things that the pandemic showed is that um, one of the reasons people weren't getting a lot of, a lot of shots is because um, they didn't have a way to get there. Uh, it wasn't convenient, it wasn't close. And so um, there was, a, every year the hospitals have to do a, um, a needs assessment. And this year, and a couple of years ago, 
they invited churches to be a part of the needs assessment and they asked us what kinds of things were we seeing as um, we were reaching out to people during the pandemic. Um, Shallow was one of the churches that did a regular uh, food giveaway. We gave away groceries to anybody that came, no income requirements. If they came and said they wanted groceries, they came. And a lot of people weren't able to get there um, we tried to have it at one point at the recreation center thinking it was central in the city and it would be easier for people to get to, but it wasn't. Um, and so we went back to the church because there is a bus stop right on the corner and so people were able to, to get there through the bus stop. So um, I don't think we always think about accessibility to healthcare. I understand that there's a four-year project going on and the former landmark shopping center to bring a hospital there. Um, that part of the city has had an increased population. Um, and so there, the closest was the Alexandria Hospital on Seminary Road, which wasn't really that close to them. So healthcare um, was, is a serious issue that people are facing. Um, we can't overlook the justice system that is not as just as we would like it to be. And so um, as, was, as has been the case in history, um, there's, a there's a larger population, a larger percentage of the population of African Americans that are actually in jail. I had a nephew that was in um, uh, one of the state prisons and took 10 hours to drive there, which was kind of crazy, but we had to go outside of West Virginia and come back. And um, as I walked through and visited, um, it was very obvious the population that was there. And unfortunately, because of you know not being able to afford legal help, um, our young people end up getting longer sentences for some of the same things that others can get shorter sentences for. And so um, Lady Justice is not blind. And, um, and so I think those are probably three of the most, um, uh, and all of them are important, but I think those are three of the most blaring challenges that African Americans face right now. I'm gonna add one more to that, and that is gonna be um, the cancellation of African American history in elementary schools and how the governor only wants to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, which is in January, um, until you're in the, wait until you're 12 years old or in the sixth grade to celebrate that. And that, to me, that's just horrible. Why would you wait to do that? But I have a follow-up question for you, Reverend Caldwell. Um, is the Alexandria Shiloh Baptist Church related to the Fredericksburg Shiloh Baptist Church? No, it is not. Um, Shiloh Baptist, Shiloh as the name of a church is very common mm -hmm. in African-American communities. Shiloh means the place of refuge, the place of rest. And um, almost anywhere there's a significant population of African-Americans you will find a shallow church, whether it's a Baptist church or an AME church, um, AME, African Methodist Episcopal. Um, and so they're, they're not, they're just, we have same name, that's all. Okay, thank you for that. Uh -huh. So um, Ms. Davis, why doesn't the city document and tell the story of Samuel Tucker and more African Americans that why is, it, why is it, the question is why doesn't it? Yes. Well, it actually is. It's, it's, it's telling the story, definitely telling the story of Samuel Tucker because uh, next week I'll be heading with Rose Dawson from our Alexandria Library to Austin, Texas, where we, we will be presenting with Lisa Guernsey of New America on uh, Samuel Wilbert Tucker at the South by Southwest EDU conference. 
Uh, there's a lot going on this year is the 85th anniversary of the sit-in, so the library is going to have a, quite a, a number of programs. We will be focusing on that and that history, and we have received grants to help digitize collections, and uh, a book is in the works. So, And then we also had a book recently published by Dr. Brenda Mitchell Powell called Public in Name Only on the 1939 sit-in. Uh, so I have to say that there's a lot that is going on, and there are a lot more signs coming out this year. So that will be focusing on different African Americans. So uh, we'll have six new signs in our African American Heritage Park alone, and a number of new signs. And then also along Duke Street, we have Two years ago, we hired an uh, African-American research historian who is creating uh, seven signs along the Duke Street corridor relating to African-American history. And that's just a small amount of the signage that's going in about African-American life and history in the city. Thank you very much. Professor Moon, can you briefly discuss the history of what is called Mudtown near the current, uh, near, near Alexander City Right, High the School? seminary neighborhood. Seminary, oh, yeah. seminary, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, sure, I can talk, I'll talk briefly <laughs> about it. So the seminary neighborhood, um, what I know from it is from my work on Fort Ward because the fort, as the neighborhood was known as, um, that is now the site of the park, uh, the, many of the families had settled in the area as neighbors, as families, and as friends. Uh, they often went to church together at Oakland Baptist, um, and they went to school together. So there, there's a lot of connection between those two communities. Um, we find African Americans living both at the fort uh, and at the seminary neighborhood by at least the late 1860s. That's what we can document. Um, and many of them worked um, at VTS, um, an Episcopal high school. Uh, uh, one of the headmasters actually uh, was a wonderful diarist, and he would write about African Americans, their names, and what they were doing in their lives, visiting their homes, holidays all sorts of stuff. So we have a, a picture of everyday life uh, that normally we don't have, uh, especially for the late 19th century, especially for a rural area uh, like Fairfax County, because at that time that was Fairfax County. Um, up until 1930, uh, the seminary was Fairfax, and then the you know annexation happened that was the line Quaker Lane, and then the next annexation, 52, uh, that was when the fort or Fort Ward became part of the city as well. Um, and then from that time period, um, from the late 1860s, the community really flourished uh, and continued to flourish uh, until uh, the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, when it became a, a target for eminent domain and the construction of a, on what um, at the time was going to be an all-white high school that we know as T.C. Williams High School. Uh, and uh, we have, within the land records, you can see sort of the processes that happened uh, to take that land and to build that high school, um, which we now know as Alexandria City High School. Thank you. This question is for um, Ms. Davis. When will Alexandria's pillar from Montgomery Alabama be displayed here? Well, part of the goal initially when Brian Stevenson uh, discussed uh, these community coalitions, as he calls, uh, called them. Uh, one of the goals was learning the history, teaching your community the history, and then receiving the pillar. We are not, we are actually where we should be uh, with EJI. We actually have gone above and beyond what most community coalitions have done. So has uh, Maryland has done a great deal. They have done a lot. One of the things that we are still waiting on from EJI and that we are not in control of, of is the pillar. And one of the things that we have heard from EJI is that they're probably going to hold back on the pillars because they felt that for, for some who were involved that it was more about the pillar than about the community learning the history. So they really want to make sure the community is engaged and is looking at the history. So if you will notice on our website for the ACRP, we no longer have the focus on the pillar. We are very happy to get the pillar. 
when they release it to us, and we hope that it will be able to be installed in a very prominent place. But if for some reason EJI uh, is not willing to release pillars to any community, uh, then uh, we in Alexandria and our ha Alexandria are happy to have our own pillar uh, that we we will put up. But we are waiting for instruction uh, from EJI, and we have a rep that we meet with regularly. So just to let you know that they are very pleased. They actually use what Alexandria does in their promotional materials because we were just out of the gun, so excited about being able to be a part of this and to tell this story. So we will keep you abreast. Uh, we try to be very transparent with everything that we do, uh, working with EJI, and as we receive updates from them, we will make them public on our website too. Thank you for that. And just as a follow-up question, um, as president of the Alexandria NAACP, we're in the process of restructuring our website. And in 2022, we took a pilgrimage to Montgomery, Alabama. Some of you sitting in the audience was, were on that pilgrimage. I took quite a few pictures and I will make sure that um, the picture of the pillar is on our website by the end of next month, okay? So my next question is for anyone that would like to take it, what is the role of black banks in developing housing and businesses? Kristen. <laughs> I'm like, I'm ready. Yeah, you're right. You I'm ready. So what's interesting, um, actually, even in the 19th century here in Alexandria and then also in Fairfax County down in Gum Springs, we see really creative ways of pooling money and creating de facto banks amongst African-American um, would-be property owners. And they're basically like stock companies is sort of how best describe it. It's very different than how we bank today. But basically, they would loan money to a would-be um, homeowner and that they would pay like a, a set rate every month with plus interest. Uh, and the idea was that um, to help promote home ownership uh, here in Northern Virginia. The model that they're using, it's interesting, and, and again, sorry, I'm going to be deep in the weeds, um, comes actually from uh, Germany and was popular with German immigrants. And in the late 19th century, we did have a sizable German immigrant community, and a handful of African Americans were able to get loans through these German American associations here as well. Um, and so there was probably some sort of synergism, exchange of ideas that were happening amongst immigrants as well as African Americans uh, here in the city that led to these types of practices. By the 20th century, though, a lot of this sort of goes by the wayside as sort of modern banking comes into being, um, and then. And by the 1930s, we have really our modern mortgage system coming into place with the emergence of the FHA, the Federal Housing Authority, as well as the HOLC, which is the Homeowners Loan Corporation. These are New Deal policies that really sort of set the precedent for mortgages. But as a result, African Americans are often left out of that system once it becomes federalized in the 1930s. There are exceptions. Most of those exceptions we see in the 1950s. And then it really starts to change in 1968 with the passage of both the Fair Housing Act and then the follow-up, which is a HUD Act that tries to promote more equitable access to federal funding. Thank you. I'd like to add um, something about the role of uh, African-American banks. Um, there is in the DMV uh, Industrial Bank, which is celebrating 160 years, and their role has been... Um, equalizing and allowing access, not just for home ownership, but small businesses and other things that are important to African Americans that they don't have access to in some of the larger banks. They're still, though it's illegal now, um, but at one point there was a lot of redlining practiced in some of the mainline banks that limited the amount of money and where um, African Americans could uh, get a loan to, to buy a house. And um, with the emergence of a number of, the number of black banks has decreased in the country, but there's still about 26, and three of them are in this area, in the DMV. Um, there have been, during the, the most recent real estate bust, I guess you could call it, there were a number of churches in particular that the um, national banks were calling their loans on. 
and it was the existence of the um, of of the of industrial bank in particular that was able to bail them out and prevent those churches from having to close their doors, which would have happened if the loans had been called like they were attempting to do in the main line. So the role is equalizing, if you will, um, access to financing, whether it is for a house or a business, and, and so um, supporting those banks. And their charter tends to be a little different. They tend to be community development banks. And so by being community development banks, the monies that they make stay in the community that they are. And that's very important for uh, the African-American community. Thank you. Darylyn, could I clarify sure. something in my uh, last answer? Sure. Go right okay. ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware, because I was, as I was talking about the pillar, I, I realized not everyone may be aware of what the pillar is. So uh, at EJI, when you visit uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, and you wind through the memorial, you see a bronze pillar, uh, and they have one for every county, every state that had lynchings, and on that bronze pillar are listed the names of the people and the year that they were lynched. Alexandria has one. What they also did, or what Brian Stevenson also had done, was to create a duplicate pillar for everyone that is hanging in the memorial. And you will find those around the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. So if you go to Montgomery, Alabama, and you go to the memorial, you can find the Alexandria Pillar. You can find it two places. You can find it where it hangs, and then you can also find it uh, where it's sort of on the ground, um, it's horizontal on the ground. So those were the ones that were to go to communities. I want to clarify that no community in the United States, as far as we know of, has received one of the bronze pillars. But I do want to say that EJI does sponsor markers and that they pay for markers that look like our state highway markers. And we will be see receiving two of those. Hopefully this year they, they fund them uh, for Joseph McCoy and Benjamin Thomas. So I do want to be clear on that. So we will be receiving our markers that look like state highway markers, but we will not be receiving the pillar at this point. Okay. So, oh, thank you for allowing me Thank to you for that. So the next question is to any of the panelists, mm -hmm. including myself, because I could probably answer this question. Have you, see, have you seen a change or greater awareness in the white population of these issues since the murder of George Floyd? So I want to go first. So since the murder of George Floyd under Ralph Northam, we've established in the city of Alexandria under the current administration, of the previous administration, um, the Community Policing Review Board, which I sit on the inaugural board. Um, we've also had listening sessions shortly after uh, the murder of Mr. Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, listening se uh, sessions with the NAACP and senators, uh, both Mark Warner and Senator Kane, where they took time out of their out of their schedules to sit and listen to see how we as a, our community, how we were feeling here in Northern Virginia. Um, those are two really important things that I know that have transpired. Would you like to add anything else? Changes? I can add that, well, right now, if you come by the Alexandria Black History Museum, our current exhibit is on our Black Lives Remembered collection. And we started two initiatives in 2020. We had our Collecting COVID initiative where we were documenting how Alexandria responded to COVID, and that's still an active collecting initiative. And then with the death of George Floyd, we, we established the Black Lives Remembered collection. So we went out not only documenting ourselves, city staff, but we also invited anyone who went to a vigil, a protest meeting, had created a, a poster, taken a photograph, and it's not just in Alexandria, we've opened it to the whole DMV and we have over 300 images in our collection that we show on monitors in the gallery. And it's a living exhibition in that if someone walks in the door today to say that I attended a vigil about George Floyd in Loudoun County, if they give us the photographs, we can have them up and on the monitors within 48 hours and they're credited. And one thing that we are also doing out of coming out of George Floyd and also our greater move towards equity. Say you've taken 10 photographs and uh, 
you might want to say have a series of posters done from the photographs that you've taken but you've also donated those photos to us and they are part of the city collection what we do is we do not retain copyright so we have the photos in our collection that we use for educational purposes but we in no way prevent you from being able to use your photos to create posters to create if you're an artist to continue to earn money from your artwork it is not ours to possess and we are looking at all of our collections policies and how we manage collections and how we retain collections because we want the donors to have agency and be able to guide us on the appropriate way to have have items in an exhibit so that we're not just putting black history up but not thinking of the people who donated the items or who were impacted by some of the actions the items relate to thank you one of the changes that I think has occurred since um, Black Lives Matter is, um, well, since George Floyd's murder, is uh, in terms of do have white people indicated or gotten more information? And I think that there, the, his death sparked a lot of conversations about police brutality, about social justice, and the need for some structural change. So I do think that there has been more conversation. Um, I think there still needs to be more uh, execution, if you will. Uh, now, maybe I don't want to say that word. <laughs> more implementation, OK? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, Professor Moon. If we are gathered together again on February 26, 2034, which is in 10 years, mm -hmm. and you're pleased with the progress Alexandria has made relative to black history, in your own words, what will have changed between now and then? What do you hope will have changed? So, so it's funny because some of the, the, the way the conversation has been going actually speaks to one of the things that I hope to change. and. Um, one of the things that I see here in the city is that we often do history in a reactive, not proactive way. And that we also don't think about African American history that should be everywhere in this city. Every place, every house, every interpretive sign should be engaging African American history. Um, we need to completely revise the way we understand our past, all of it from the 18th century to now. That's what we gotta do, that's the next step. And we can't just wait for something bad to happen and react. We have to take ownership of our past. This is the moment. Our collections and archives are so much more accessible now in ways they never were. Uh, we can rewrite history, we can sort of break the divide that, that, that slavery caused to connect people into the antebellum period in ways we never could before, as you know, thinking of Charbaugh in her work. The, this, the time is now. We can do better, and that's what I hope for. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Why didn't we rename the, Parker, um, the high school Parker Gray? Anyone know? Anyone want to answer that? Why didn't we rename the high school Parker Gray? You mean Alexandria City High School? Yes. I do not know. I think that would be, I don't know who we named that with. Yeah, there was a lot of debate about the name. Yeah, and there were, I know that there were several select, I mean, yeah. names Petitions. that were put forward. Yeah. But, but, we but chose I, don't, I honestly don't, well. don't know why it was not. I mean, yeah. that was not. I I not see that. Actually, I think it's a good thing to not use somebody's name as evidenced by wanting to change it from T.C. Williams um, because what happens is, you know, when the school was named after him, it was because he was honored. Then we found out about, you know, anyway, they decided it wasn't an honor. They didn't want to honor his um, segregation has passed and so forth. And I, I think that um, sometimes when we pick somebody's name, we don't know what 10 years from there, 20 years from there, people are gonna think about that person. So um, I, I don't think it's a bad idea not to name it after an individual. Okay, so the next question I'm gonna answer again. So 
Carter G. Woodson, you ask what state, or excuse me, what state he was born, or from, what state was Carter Woodson from? He was from Virginia, and he was born, he was born in New Canton, Virginia in 1875. And he died in 1950 at age 74 in Washington, D.C. Okay, this question is for Audrey. Why mention of the Gonzaga High School exhibition, the third floor, focused on the enslaved young man, Gabriel Dorsey, who was sold through read that. Sold through uh, 1315 Duke Street. Okay, I'm sorry. I can't read. Handwriting. Do you know anything about this? And can you enlighten us on this? Sure. And it's the question of why? Yes. Why um, no mention of the exhibit? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm remiss in, in mentioning that exhibit. And it is a temporary exhibit, and that's probably why I, I didn't mention it. But it is on display right now. If you get our This Week in Historic Alexandria, we do promote the exhibit every week. It is a wonderful exhibit done by Gonzaga students, and I have to say I'm very proud of them. I am um, a product of Catholic schools, and Gonzaga was our uh, brother's school. And these are the students who are actually doing research on the Catholic Church's role uh, in the slave trade, in the domestic slave trade. And so they have done with their professor uh, a wonderful exhibit. There are about six panels that are up on the third floor that you can see about the exhibit, and we're happy to host it for another few months. So I do encourage you, even if you've been to Freedom House before, to come up and take a look at the exhibit. And so I am, I apologize for not mentioning that earlier, but it is wonderfully done. And I'm so proud of the students because that was something that when I went to Georgetown Visitation Preparatory School and on our, our campus, we had a, what was called a slave cabin, but we never talked about the history of the enslaved who came with some of the young girls who went to school who, or that the sisters had enslaved. We never talked about that history, and I'm actually proud to say at my high school now, there is a committee that is researching the history of uh, the sisters and their role uh, in the slave trade and who were the enslaved at my high school as the Gonzaga students are doing. And so I'm so pleased that students are being proactive and adding to this story, and now we know this really sad story about a little boy named Gabriel who was enslaved and we can share that story with the public. So I think it's more students are, and, and this is one thing that's so great in schools now and I think and it's actually, you see more of it now since the death of George Floyd, where students are becoming much more proactive in the history that they're being taught, especially in high school, because they know that they're not getting the true story. So if they want to hear it, they have to do it themselves. And so I think we owe them just you know, great gratitude for being able to do that when they're in many states being prevented at doing it at all costs. Absolutely. Thank you. So what's on the screen now is a picture I took in October 2022, which is the pillar of Virginia Alexandria of Joseph McCoy and Benjamin Thomas and the dates that they were deceased, just so you all can have a reference of a copy of it. And it hangs from the ceiling down as to suggest these are the ways that people were hung back in the 1800s. Thank you, Ricardo, for putting that up. Um, and this will also be on the NAACP website at the end of next month. Okay, so the next question I'm going to kind of narrow down and just ask the question. So what are the plans for any oral history in the city of Alexandria? In North Old Town, we've been using oral history of Virginia Napper, who, Napper, Napper, who lived and worked here in an area known as Cross Canal. Canal. You know, Miss. So you want to answer the question? <laughs> um, so there, Thank you. well, I'm going to tag team with Audrey, I think, on this okay. one. Okay. So, so there is actually a wonderful collection of transcribed oral histories starting in the 1990s, although we have some from the 18, 1980s oh, yeah. as well, of African-American residents who lived in different neighborhoods. And this was actually started by, I want to say in 1983, by Pam Cressy, because, you know, I've been in all your boxes. Yes, so yes. Uh, for the OHA's archive, 
archive. <laughs> um, and that she was able to get um, funding to learn about African-American neighborhoods um, because oftentimes the ways in which people talk about their community doesn't show up in the official records, right? It doesn't show up in the census. It doesn't show up in the tax records. And these oral histories was a way for us to learn everybody's uh, everyday stories, but also to delineate communities in ways we never had done before. Um, and those, and by the 90s, we started doing Fort Ward and the seminary, sort of other neighborhoods, sort of outside, sort of the main historic district. And Virginia Knappers is one that is used frequently because she's one of the few um, persons who could talk to us about Cross Canal, which was a neighborhood literally along the the old canal in the northern part of the city. And she worked in the glass factory, or her, glass yeah, factory. she worked in one of the glass factories, um, and archaeologists have actually found um, remnants from that glass factory uh, in her neighborhood. So, and her family is still in the yeah, area, I think right? They even have a glass pig that she, that she glass she, pig, she, yeah, yeah, that she made. But we currently are expanding our oral history program, and now I'm going to tag in Audrey for the rest. Yes, <laughs> with our, I mentioned our we org earlier in the evening, and. One of the things that's come out of the reorg certainly was, you know, always our intention to promote oral history and to document it. And now we have a oral history center within the Office of Historic Alexandria. We have a wonderful gentleman, uh, Dr. Um, Francesco De Salvatore, who is our director of oral history. I've been working with him, looking at the Douglas Cemetery uh, community and also Colored Rosemont. And he has been going around the city, capturing oral histories from, from many citizens. And so we are so proud that we now have the center and he, has, he is building his staff for the center and archiving these oral histories. So in many in many years, when people look back, we will have documented not only our, our white community, our black community, our new immigrant community, we will be do uh, looking at students, students who went on our pilgrimage. Uh, often students also have taken oral histories that have donated them to us, and we've accepted oral histories from people that have done them independently. So looking back many years from now, we will have this wonderful repository in people's own voice of what it was like to live in Alexandria. And then I also want to mention that uh, for the 275th anniversary of the city of Alexandria, which is happening this year, a lot of anniversaries this year, uh, 85th anniversary of the sit-in, 275th of the city of Alexandria, 10-year anniversary for the Contraband and Freedmen Cemetery Memorial. But there will be a new exhibit downstairs uh, for the 275th, and it will be based on our oral histories, looking back at Alexandria history. So I encourage you to come back to the Lyceum to see that. Okay, so I have five more questions I can take, which are in my hand. Okay, so a recent report published by the Northern Virginia Health Foundation revealed that in the city of Alexandria, the rate of premature death, that is before the age of 75, is almost 120% greater for blacks than for whites. And some consensus tracks the disparity is 400% higher. What can the city do to mitigate the disparities in premature deaths? Anyone want to take that? Oh, Sheila. Oh. <laughs> One of the things that um, has been done or can be done is looking at um, more community-based healthcare um, and increasing the number of, um, and not just hospitals, but the number of, um, I'm trying to remember what they call them, but they're like, um, they're short-term care facilities that they can put in the community um, and put in neighborhoods where there is no access, there is no um, health care facilities at all. Um, and so, and looking at transportation, I think, uh, again, transportation was raised as one of the reasons that uh, people don't have uh, um, equitable access to health care because um, there isn't transportation in some of the areas where people live. So those are just a couple of things off the top of my head I could think about. So there's also the importance of making sure that our um, more seasoned citizens go to the doctor on a regular basis. Um, in not too long ago, uh, Dexter King died of prostate cancer. And he was in stage four and was like, 
a shock to the world, at least it was to me and in my community. And everyone was like, well, why didn't he catch this earlier? And, you know, the men that I know, you know, they were indicating, well, did he ever go to the doctor? And I know for some African-Americans, that is really important. And then finding the time and then being able to afford health care. And that is a huge disparity. You know, it's either paying a doctor bill or putting food on the table for your grandkids, because a lot of of our, of our senior citizens, or a lot of our seasoned citizens, I should say, are taking care of their grandchildren on a fixed income and trying to live in the city of Alexandria and you know, making sure that you have enough money to afford in order to live. I think you know, that, that is huge, that's huge here. Um, does anyone else wanna follow up with that? I, I was just gonna add, and because of what you said, it's surprising to some, how many people don't have health care insurance. And not having insurance, then what happens is the emergency rooms, the hospital emergency rooms, are used as doctors. You know, so um, I think if insurance were more affordable, um, that would certainly help uh, people get more insurance. But, you know, when you have to make a choice between paying for health insurance or, you know, getting groceries or paying your house note, uh, insurance kind of falls down on the bottom of the list. I did a paper on that in grad school, except it was for um, the children's health insurance program, CHIPS, in the states throughout the country, because a lot of people do use the emergency rooms as doctor's office. They only go to the doctor when they're really sick. Okay, the next question. Um, throughout the nation, Highways, freeways were constructed directly through African American communities. Was this also true with 395, 95, and 495? Kristen. <laughs> um, and Route 1. Route 1. Everyone. So um, we know for 395, it cuts right through, at least in terms of our footprint that is Alexandria today. It cut right through Lincolnia, uh, which was an African American community that emerged um, after the Civil War. Um, much of it is, is disappeared uh, through um, through first the highway construction. And by the way, some of the most vocal advocates for school integration were actually from the Lincolnia neighborhood because their kids had to travel all the way to Lyle's Crouch to go to elementary school. And so they were part of that NAACP lawsuit in like 1958, 1959 to desegregate our, our schools here. Um, so they're, they're an important part of our story as a community. And they had to deal with the construction of um, the high, 395. Uh, and then eventually their land was rezoned uh, into um, multi-family units and commercial and then heavy industry, which is a classic tactic as well to push people out of a neighborhood um, for, for that area. Uh, Route 1 um, is an expansion that um, leads to a lot of displacement in the 1950s and 1960s, um, and again, affected people along pa uh, Patrick and Henry Streets here. Uh, in Old Town, and many African-American families were also displaced from that, and I think that's another subject that probably needs more thorough uh, work to find out who was displaced through the expansion of that road. There was talks, for example, of literally bulldozing full blocks um, of the city to expand, if you can imagine everybody, like something akin to 95 uh, for Route 1. Uh, those were one of the conversations after the war. But regardless, they did do an expansion and people were displaced. Okay, thank you. So we have a person in the audience that states, my concern is the decline in the testing scores for young African American students. Segregation was an advantage for many black students because they were taught by black teachers who loved them. Um, how do we improve black student testing scores? Any teachers in the house outside of Miss <laughs> Professor? No? I'm on the other end sort of at the college level. So I, I can speak to it a little bit. 
Okay. I mean, I, I do think we, we've got to figure out better ways to, to meet people and meet children where they are um, and to believe in them. I think that's one of the hardest things, um, even for my own kids, um, to find teachers that believe in them. I think we need to invest in good teachers. That's number one. Um, and classroom management, um, which sounds really arcane and, and whatnot, but it's absolutely critical to teach and make sure teachers are empathetic and sympathetic and, and see ch their children that they're teaching as human and know that they can reach the stars. Um, that's number one. We don't invest in education, number two, um, in the way that we should and the way that other people in other parts of the world do. What I see rolling on into my college classes shock me. Um, compare, I started teaching in 1999, um, and I have students who have never read a book um, don't know how to read books. I have to talk to them about active reading, about sustained attention. They're so distracted by their cell phones and social media. Um, we have to get them back anchored and, and that foundation to, to, to learn deeply and profoundly. Um, and it's hard because, you know, the parents, including myself, uh, I'm throwing myself under the bus. Also on my cell phone all the time, right? I can't miss things. I don't want to miss things. So I think there is so, this is not like a one fix problem. There's so many layers to this issue. We also, as a society, need to care about education. Um, you know, the rampant anti-intellectualism that we see in this country is a huge problem. And as a result, you know, people don't value learning. Like, I believe in lifelong learning. I mm. might, you know, be a college professor and perhaps it's my day job, but I do believe we should want to learn all the time. We should want, and we want young people to be that way too. I also believe we should be global citizens, right? And, and to learn about people not like ourselves, right? Uh, and we want our young people to be that way too. I think, unfortunately, the educational system in America has stopped educating and stopped um, students aren't learning. They are taught how to take a test. And um, I don't think that, the, and the test, the purpose of the test is tied to uh, funding for the system, which is why everybody is pushing the test. When we were growing up, with less material, um, it, even though Plessy versus Board of Education was supposed to do separate but equal, it was never equal. The supplies that the black schools got and the teachers got, if they got any, um, were used or hand downs from the white schools. And, um, but the students learned they did not necessarily learn how to take a test, but they learned life skills, they learned knowledge, they were able to graduate from school and start families, raise children based on what they learned in school. Um, they're not even teaching kids today how to, to write. There's no physical education, there's no civic education, and so um, the reason children aren't learning is because they aren't taught how to learn. They're just taught how to take a test. So I think there was a, a gentleman for, he was a Japan, he was from Japan, but he had lived in this country all his life. And he said that the Amer America need to be thankful for, um, oh, I'm trying to remember, but I think it's the 1B, it's a, a passport that students get to come to this country. Um, and that if they ever, if they ever um, not pass or cancel that law, we would be in trouble. Because if you look at the higher level um, technology uh, experts, they are, are not, they're not from here. They're from their students that come here to get an education. And now they're going back to their countries mm -hmm. because it's, it's, they are, are using what they have learned to, to help their, their country progress. Whereas our students are, are at the, you know, they're at the top level of the class and our students are at the bottom level. And so I think it goes back to what we call education in America today. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Go ahead, Miss. 
Um, and I feel like I have to say, because I hear the voices of my parents, I mean, who were both educators, <laughs> like say something. So I, um, <laughs> I know, I'm not an educator, I'm just a parent. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just uh, the, the child of, of two educators. And I, I have to say that I remember when my mother was actually teaching, uh, trying to teach black history, she taught in Northern Virginia for close to 40 years. And the pushback she would get from even putting up a bulletin board to talk about just maybe three African American figures, mm -hmm. and it and I think you know it was we have grown farther, but we are now moving back where you want to restrict the history. And I have to say again, students learning difficult history, I mean, is important because it makes them more empathetic people, mm -hmm. and I think it makes them better citizens. And it is scary what you say about social media because I can guarantee you, you go into any school now, especially a high school and ask anybody about, say, their Kardashians, they could rattle off how many people are in the family, what their income is, whether they have a jet. But if you ask them just a basic piece of American history, they would be completely, completely lost. And the other thing I have to say is I know parents are concerned about what their students are learning, but trust the educators. That is what their training is in. It, it was scary to see how educators were seen as heroes at the beginning of the pandemic and villains now recently and it's like these people have studied they they are trying to do the best for your students become an ally don't become an enemy for them and i think that you know it will be it will be in a much better place but don't deny real history the more you deny it the worse place will be and you have to have students who know the trajectory of our country because mm -hmm. as, they, as they always say, if you don't know this history, we're bound to repeat the mistakes in our past. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And something, because I also came from a family of educators. I had two aunts, uh, both taught reading. And um, the first thing they would always tell me is that education begins at home. And you have that as your foundation. And then I am a product of public school systems. However, I tested horribly, ACT, G GRE, horrible test scores, but I still graduated from college and, and graduate school because I had people in my life, particularly my parents, my grandparents, and my extended family who constantly instilled in me the hope that I needed in order to proceed in life. So to, test scores mean nothing as long as you have a will and a determination to want to succeed in life. I'm going to ask one more question, and this goes back to what Audrey just talked about. Um, Alexandria has a Democratic primary in June. What issues are most important to our African-American community? And I'm going to say this. We want to go forward or we want to go back? And our democracy, voting rights, education, health care, jobs, our economy, everything that you can imagine is on the agenda, excuse me, is on the ballot. So that decision is yours, but I'm gonna ask our panel, because that's who I am, <laughs> what do you think are the major issues? I, I, I would just say, what I would second what Daryl Lynn said, equity, accessibility, having your voice heard, having equity across the board and, and accessibility and making sure that all of our programs are reaching the communities they need to reach and making sure that you know we are holding uh, politicians accountable to if, if you're coming in on a platform and and that's your platform then absolutely hold feet to the fire to make sure that these things get done and that are not just a campaign promise and then get forgotten about in a few months so. i agree anyone else Truth is on the I'll go. Truth is on the ballot. Being being honest is on the ballot. It is. Um, I still believe that America is a country of the people, by the people, and for the people. And the only reason that it fails to be that is the people abdicate their responsibility. And so, on the ballot, um, I think. While voting and electing people is important and everybody needs to vote, that doesn't end our responsibility. <laughs> okay. And so there are things that 
may not be on the ballot, but that doesn't mean that they're not important to the people, and it's up to the people to make sure that it gets addressed. Um, and it's easier now to do it than it was. My grandfather was one of the first African Americans to run for Alexandria City Council. And um, I, I, being nosy and you know, as a child, I remember the meetings and the discussions that were going on. I have since then um, actually managed a number of campaigns throughout the state of Maryland. And, um, and I know very well that people will say anything to get your vote. Um, and they get away with that if we vote for them and don't hold them accountable. What's going on in the meetings when they have, they have weekly meetings and they're making decisions that affect our lives and we're not there, and most of them today are televised. So, I mean, you can sit at home and watch the meeting even if you don't go in. And so um, I think what needs to be on the ballot is um, the people's responsibility to hold elected officials accountable. And uh, so, I mean, in addition to housing, I, what I'm told, now, I, I'm told that, that the price of housing in Alexandria is causing people to leave the city because they can't afford the housing. Um, and there's more housing happening in a lot of the, the housing stock that um, has been around for a while. They've got legislation that they're trying to tear it down or build around it and build other housing around it. And we just need to watch some of the zoning laws and make sure that as they're being changed, there be that, that public input into that change and how it affects your property that's next door to something that they're building, how that's affected. And so um, housing was, is and probably will be an issue on ballots for a time to come. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much, ladies and gentlemen, our panel. Thank you so much to those of you that hung in here the entire time. I thought that was not just instructive, but very inspiring. And I want to thank each of you for being here. You know, if you haven't been to the Contraband of Freedmen's Cemetery, if you haven't been to Freedom House, if you haven't been to the African American History Museum in Parker Gray, I mean, go visit them. Um, there's also a manumission, a manumission tour uh, company that was organized by one of our members of council that gives a really nice tour of several, actually now several different tours about the history of uh, African Americans in Alexandria. I mean, my last observation to offer here, because I can because I'm chairman, is that Right now, we talk about housing. We've got eight to 10,000 people moving to the city now every year. They're mostly not minorities. They're mostly very affluent white people who know nothing about the history of the city. And I would challenge each of you, if you know somebody who's moved here, you befriend them, you meet them in church, you meet them at a PTA meeting, make sure they understand the history of the city and how important it is because Alexander's history is so unique. We were a refuge after the Civil War for people to come here and feel safe. And to, and to live a productive life. Uh, and now what we've done by becoming the city of essentially very affluent people and very few poor people, um, we're losing that. Uh, the, the integration that, that created sort of a really uh, cohesive social fabric. Uh, when, when, when my kids were certainly younger in the public schools, and I would urge people to try to make sure that new residents understand um, what they need to do to be sort of be a contributing part of this community because I, I worry now that a lot of people who are transient are going to be here for two or three years, they're going to move in, move out, and, and the problems they create by driving up housing prices is not going to help not just the African American community but the Latino community and others who want to live here but can't afford to. So thank you all for being here tonight. That, sure, go ahead. Um, the Shallow Baptist Church is 161 years old. We have inside our lobby a, uh, a wall of history that covers that time in terms of things that were happening in the city of Alexandria, and I invite you to uh, call and schedule an opportunity to go through and, and view that wall of history. Anyway, thank you for coming. See you next month. I hope in March on the arena. This is Agenda Alexandria, a nonpartisan organization that takes a look at the issues without taking sides. 
Whether it's the city's sewer system, education, public safety, climate change, or perhaps a look back into Alexandria's history, Agenda Alexandria is here to shine a light. What makes the organization so successful is our people. The people who run it, our panelists, our moderators, and of course, our members. Agenda Alexandria is a member-funded organization, and we invite you to become one today by visiting agendaalexandria.org.